Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for um, for attending uh, this uh, this language sciences talk um, by um, Karine Ochino and um, Jalan Begay. Um, to start off with, I'm Ella van Resnicek. I'm the coordinator for the BC Language Sciences Initiative. Um, I'm very glad to, to see so many um, familiar and new faces along the participants um, list. Uh, to begin with, um, customarily UBC, we acknowledge that the UBC Point Grey campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, because we're scattered at the moment, you might be calling in from the traditional territories of other peoples. Um, I'm currently an uninvited guest on um, Squamish land. Um, I spent much of my life um, on um, Ka and Osage lands. Um, I'm privileged and grateful to be here today. Uh, we invite you to learn more about the traditional territories that you're on uh, by visiting native-land.ca. Um, we've sent around a respectful state, um, space statement, so thank you for um, helping and making this um, a safe learning space. Um, we will be recording this event and ask that you don't. Um, Language Sciences uh, is a research cluster on campus that aims to connect scholars, teachers, and researchers working in all areas of language sciences to create collaborations that produce and support innovative research. Um, we host a regular talk series, this one, um, inviting prominent language sciences researchers um, from around the world to present on varied areas of research. Called, um, recently, we've begun hosting these talks online. Uh, so that's where we're at today. <laughs> so we appreciate your patience as we um, sort out any technical details. Um, if you have any problems um, viewing the um, ASL interpreters um, who are, are interpreting for our deaf and hard of hearing um, and signing friends today, um, please uh, let me know. Um, uh, I and one of the fellow moderators will be keeping an eye out on the chat. Um, so if there are any concerns, like please um, ping us. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, Daisy Rosenblum, who um, is graciously um, hosting this talk today. Um, she'll be moderating questions later, um, introducing um, Karine and Jalan. I'm pulling up her bio now. Um, Dr. Rosenblum is a language sustainability and transnationalism research lead for the Language Sciences Initiative and an assistant professor in critical indigenous studies and anthropology at UBC. She specializes in the multimodal documentation and description of indigenous languages in North America with an emphasis on methods, partnerships, and products that contribute or contribute to community-based language reclamation. She currently works with speakers of Kwakwala, of Akashan language in BC to record narrative, conversation, and other types of spontaneous speech for today's and tomorrow's learners and teachers of the language. And she is the one who introduced us to um, Jelan and Karine. So we're very happy to have her here. Thanks, Ella. Um, so it's uh, it's really a treat to um, to be able to introduce Jalan and Kareen. Um, I first met Jalan in two thousand eight um, at UCSB, where we were students together, um, and we briefly shared an art studio together. I think we were both uh, missing being able to to create in other ways while we were in grad school. Um, so. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to get to know Kareen um, as well uh, uh, over the past couple of years, just an, an interact with their work, which is so exciting. So um, to give you a little bit of information about um, each of them, Dr. Kareen Ochino is a research assistant professor at the Center on Culture and Language in the National Technical Institute for the Deaf of the Rochester Institute of Technology, where she directs the Multimodal Language Lab. Um, her research explores the use of how language itself impacts the organization and structure of language. Um, and Dr. Ochino focuses primarily on multimodal spoken language and signed, signed languages to better understand the role of visual modality and the structures of complex systems. And she also works on documenting linguistic variation and language attitudes about variation in ASL and on language change in related signed languages. Um, Jalan Begay is a doctoral student in the Department of Linguistics at the University of New Mexico and a visiting scholar at the Department of Linguistics at University of Rochester. Um, Dr. Begay, uh, I guess not quite doctor yet, but soon. Um, Jalan Begay's primary research is descriptive and theoretical um, uh, on Navajo, on the Navajo language and Apachean language spoken in the American Southwest. 
Uh, this work includes describing the lesser known areas of the grammar, focus particles, and tensifiers, discontinuous of adverbial constructions or frames, discourse markers, post positions, and derivational morphology. And he's also interested in comparative non-Denae linguistics, grammaticalization theory, construction, grammar, and usage-based approaches. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to them. And um, it's great to have you, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get the screen sharing going. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Are we in side by side mode? Um, since we're in presenter view, I can't actually see anybody anymore. So, yes, I can see you okay. side by side. Yeah. Okay, so um, if the participants can comment, um, if you're having any problems seeing the interpreter, please make sure that um, you just let us know. Because um, I don't know if what we're seeing is what you're seeing. Okay, so thank you so much to uh, the Linguistics Department, Language Science Talk Series, and University of British Columbia. Um, for inviting Jalan and I to give this talk today. When we had first talked to Daisy about giving this talk, we were really hoping that we would have a, a chance to come and see you all in person, but circumstances being as they are, we are here in New Mexico. So um, today we're going to talk to you about um, classifier constructions in ASL and Navajo and do a direct comparison between the two. Um, as you're going to see, these languages are often kind of thrown together in random ways when people are making comparisons. And so we wanted to do a more systematic kind of blow by blow and see are these actually similar or different. So this is kind of our research question for the day. Are the classificatory constructions in ASL and Navajo similar or not? So just to give you guys a little taste, um, we're going to give you a brief typological profile of ASL and Navajo. So here you can see a map of the French Sign Language family, um, part of it actually. We're zoomed in on uh, North America right here. And so you can see the darker red color is where ASL is spoken all throughout the US and most parts of Canada. Um, the little lighter pink area is uh, Quebecois Sign Language, which is still part of the French family, but is not ASL. Um, there are about estimate, uh, estimated 250,000 signers, probably give or take 250,000 signers. We really don't have a good um, grasp on how many signers there are because it's not a question on the census, unfortunately. Um, but this is a mix of deaf and hearing folks who use ASL as their primary language. Um, ASL has a tendency for subject verb object, verb object subject verb object, um, constructions um, with the tendency for topicalization and prodrap and many, many um, polymorphemic signs. So what you're going to see is um, some examples of that polymorphemic work in action. So here's a quick example. Um, basically what we just wanted to show is that one sign can be a full proposition. So here, the English trans translation of this clip is going to be, here are your top stories today. Um, this is an introduction from CNN Sign One News, which is a really cool ASL news program. And this is Candace Jones, and she's introducing the topic. So what you're going to see her sign is important stories, and then the verb inform you all what. So what is the rhetorical question? But the important part is the inform you all, which is going to mark um, first person subject, the verb inform, and third person plural, um, plural, I don't know, I put subject, <laughs> basically object. So here I'm going to play this clip and it's going to play once in real time and once in 50% um, speed. So you're going to be looking for the sign inform you all. Okay. 
important stories inform you all what. <laughs> okay, so I'll play it one more time. Important stories inform you all what. So you can see the single sign incorporates all of that information about who's doing it, to whom, and what's being done. So in terms of Navajo, um, Navajo is classified um, as a, uh, a part of the Na Dene family. And Navajo is largely spoken in the American Southwest um, with more or less of 150,000 speakers, at least according to Ethnologue. And um, at least that includes um, speakers with uh, all kinds of varied uh, proficiency levels. And um, usually Navajo is uh, considered a, um, an SOV language or a head final or head marking language. Um, um, and in terms of its morphology, it's also considered um, morphologically complex. Um, um, some some researchers, researchers use the term polysynthetic um, um, or highly synthetic. Uh, there's a, a variety of adjectives that researchers use to describe the morphology of Navajo. Um, as you can see, this map over here is kind of like all uh, kind of like where all the languages are um, not a, not Dene languages are spoken throughout North America. And at the very bottom there, there's like an, um, a cluster in orange at the bottom, um, kind of towards the um, the US um, Mexico border where you see, you'll see a cluster there that's where basically where Navajo is spoken. And the example that we have for Navajo is basically um, also, which uh, we wanted we wanted to include an example that gives you a full proposition. And in this case, it's a uh, transitive event. So um, the, the example is basically a, a um, uh, one word can express a full proposition. In this case, it's uh, and and the glossing I have here is basically we have a third person object and a first person subject. Um, so, and the translation is I'm kicking it. In this case, um, um, the, the, as the photo shows here, it's basically the person's kicking a ball. So the it here would be the ball. Okay, so Navajo and ASL have been compared in many different ways. Um, and a lot of this has to do with this kind of complex structure in the morphology of verbs that we had just um, shown you an example of. But by far, the thing that gets compared the most when you see, if you Google Navajo and ASL linguistics, the thing that comes up the most is classificatory verb papers. So uh, we wanted to take a minute to talk about that. Um, Basically, what are classifier constructions and how do they function? We're gonna give you some examples. So um, what are classifiers? So in the literature, um, in the 1970s, when classifier um, research on classifiers began, um, the, the, this, I guess, kind of like a seminal research uh, was done by um, Allen, 1977 and um, in the paper, he says uh, classifiers typically index some perceived um, characteristic of the phenomenon to which the classification refers to. And he initially um, kind of more or less defined four basic uh, types. Um, and those include numeral classifiers, uh, concordial classifiers, interlocutive classifiers, and predicate classifiers. And then some of the languages th there are kind of kind of like exemplar languages and he uses Navajo as an as a exemplar um, language of, of predicate classifiers so um, more recently Eichenwald and Grinvolve have refined the um, classificatory category, uh, the, uh, more, uh, it's kind of like the same idea that Allen does in the 1970s, but they refine these categories of classifiers and um, um, they, 
they have they do have break it down into four basic categories as well, where you have numeral classifiers. Um, but instead of uh, um, a concordial classifier, they, they include noun classifiers, and then they have uh, genitive and possessive classifiers. And then, of course, they include the verbal classifiers, which is more, which is basically Allen's um, predicate classifiers. And also, they they exclude this uh, other category that's called a more. Uh, they call it locative classifiers, so they exclude that. Um, but they do say that we should kind of mention it but um, they kind of like put it uh, to the side so but in but in, in this in this case it's basically four basic categories as well um, and then um, in terms of verbal classifiers again they also use not only Navajo but they also um, they also use uh, uh, other Athabascan languages as an example so So um, <clears throat> the example that rather than using the other um, Athabascan um, examples, um, I, I decided to use uh, the Navajo example, some Navajo examples for um, your, your, uh, your prototypical um, verbs for, um, for carrying um, or bringing. So here it, uh, each stem more, uh, each stem classifies the type of object that we're, that, um, we're referring to. So in, in the first, at the top, I have, um, nistos, so that basically means something along the lines of I'm bringing it, which is a flat, flexible object. Um, in this case, uh, you could, it could be used for a piece of paper. Um, the, the middle example there is nistos, which is I'm bringing it. In this case, it's a non-compact matter. And the example I have there is basically, um, like a piece of cotton. It could be also kind of like a, a ball of um, wool, if you wanted to include that as an example. And then the, the bottom example there is nishka, which is I'm bringing it, an open container object. And the example there I have is a cup. So, so usually these kind of um, objects are usually used in, in relation to show um, the types of um, classificatory verb stems in Navajo. Okay, so now to give you an example of a classifier construction, actually two classifier constructions in ASL, um, I have a clip from a different news show. This is from the Daily Moth. Um, this is another ASL news program that you can watch on YouTube. And unfortunately, when you're perusing for examples on the news right now, it's really hard to find not depressing stories. So hopefully this isn't a trigger for anyone. Um, but this clip is about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's recent death. Um, and what you're going to see is actually these two classifier constructions. Um, Alex, uh, the newscaster here, is going to sign. Um, she passed away surrounded by her family, kind of looking over her, right? So you're going to see the first sign, which is the um, basically animate person classifier laying down, and then animate multiple people classifier, which is this kind of hand shape, are gonna be surrounding her. So this is one classifier that's gonna show up, and then he's gonna sign family, and then he's gonna sign looking at her. This is like multiple people looking. <clears throat> Okay, I'll play it one more time in case people need to see. I, I apologize that the video uh, quality is a little poor on this. I can see that it's been compressed multiple times as we uploaded it and downloaded it. But anyway, I think it's still all right. Someone commented that the video was kind of choppy, by the way. Okay, uh, I'm not sure. I can't really control that, but hopefully um, it'll work better the second time. Otherwise, I'll just show what it did. Like, Yeah, you should just, it's kind of choppy on my end as well. You might as well just do the sign. Okay. Okay, so basically what he signs is, here's the animate um, classifier in repose, basically. And then 
people all around, right? So this is a person laying and people all around them. And then he signs the family and then looking over her, right? So she passed away surrounded by her loved ones at her side would basically be how we would say that in English. But it's a class fair construction in ASL um, that encodes both animacy and um, lo location and position. Okay. So why have verbal classifiers? Um, two different kinds of uh, things that verbal classifiers can be doing in languages. One is basically referent tracking. So marking agreement in the verb with external NP arguments, right? So you have external NPs that are the subjects and objects of the verb. And then those things kind of get tracked in the discourse by having pieces of language that mark who and what things are happening to. And then the other thing is to basically categorize nominal arguments according to, uh, according to cognitively salient characteristics. So here, if we were going to be talking in ASL about these two adorable dogs and what they're carrying, we have the dog on the top and he's carrying something that would have this kind of a classifier, right? This kind of um, braided, braided ball. Um, and then the one on the bottom would be like a big stick, right? So we had this other classifier that talks about, you know, it wasn't a little stick like this, it was a big stick. Um, and in Navajo? So in Navajo, you would say basically, um, yo as for, the, for the, the round ball one. And then for the stick, it would be um, uh, yo tins, so. So both of these languages can basically describe what type of an object is being carried um, by this dog just by encoding those cognitively salient characteristics of the object into the verbal predicate. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of different things, but basically some criteria for these verbal classifiers are that they appear on a verb, they classify a noun, um, they're obligatory, right? Like they have to be there. They tend to encode physical characteristics of the noun. Um, generally, these verbal classifiers have a piece of the verb, a piece of the stem that's a verb and a piece of the stem that's a classifier, although we're gonna see that that's not exactly how it works in Navajo. Um, and then lastly, that these tend to occur in constructions which are talking about ob um, objects in motion or at rest. So um, you might still be wondering why have ASL and Navajo classifiers been compared? And if you're not wondering why, you might be wondering how. So um, basically, uh, again, this classifier research was really getting hot in the 70s. Alan uh, had his classifier classification paper come out, which talked about all of these different types of um, typological categories in spoken language. And then uh, Nancy Frischberg actually was the first person to introduce this term classifier into describing ASL. And she used this term to describe the hand shape, specific hand shapes that occur in, spe in specific orientations that encode semantic features of nominal arguments. So I was kind of curious about this. So I like asked Nancy recently <laughs> about, you know, like how did she kind of put these two pieces of the puzzle together? And basically, the idea is that um, she recognized that these hand shapes really marked category types. They weren't nominal in themselves, but they were a subset of hand shapes that marked category types. And those categories were basically encoding grammatical function. Um, and then basically, Sapala agreed with this. And in 78, shortly thereafter, he basically outlined all of these grammatical functions of a ton of different classifiers uh, classifier hand shapes in ASL. And then he went so far as to even align those with Allen's classifier typologies. So we're going to show you a little bit of what that looked like now. Also, one thing to note is that Frischberg um, actually wrote a paper on Navajo classifiers as well. So so she she not did not only write on Navajo, but also on ASL at the same time, at least within the same decade. So.
Okay, so here's an example from Sapala's 1986 uh, paper where he has a five part um, classification system for these classifiers. Um, on the right hand side, we just see an example that he gave for the category of semantic classifiers where you have these five different hand shapes that are within that category. Um, we're not gonna have time to go into all of these per se, um, but basically he originally came up with this five part um, distinction Um, but then shortly thereafter, um, we kind of whittled it down to a three category system. So um, these two researchers weren't looking at ASL. Um, Elizabeth Engberg Peterson works on Danish Sign Language and Adam Shembri works on Auslan and British Sign Language. But ba basically both Engberg Peterson and Shembri kind of recognized that you could classify these classifiers into three main categories. Um, they call them a little bit different things, but basically they're talking about the same types of forms and functions. So basically you have um, what's referred to as either entity classifiers, which can also be called motion and location verbs because they are verbs that encode motion and location, but that the classifier itself is something about a nominal entity that, that's part of a, a category. Um, and then handling verbs versus handling classifiers. Um, there's pretty much agreement about that, that this is how you carry or move things around, right? The, with the different hand shapes. And then either visual geometric descriptions or size and shape specifiers. Again, basically getting at the same idea that there's some kind of visual um, properties of some kind of object that you want to describe. And then you can use these classifiers to basically um, put those descriptions into the verbal complex. So here's three examples from ASL of these three categories. Um, on the left hand side, you have the entity classifier slash location motion classifier, um, which is going to be like this one on the left particularly is a vehicle classifier. So this three hand shape encodes something about some vehicle moving across water or land. Um, so here you have vehicle go. Um, the second one is flat flexible object. So this is a handling hand shape that shows you if I use this hand shape, you know that this is a thin, flexible kind of maybe piece of paper or cardboard something. Um, but this tells you something about how the object is by how I'm holding it. And then the last one is the thin cylindrical object. Um, this is an example of a size and shape specifier. Um, where basically you're talking about what something looks like. So here you have this hand shape and the extent of a pipe or a stick that you might be talking about. So you show how it looks by using this hand shape. Um, as opposed to when we saw the dog before that was carrying the big stick, you wouldn't use this. You would use a, a larger cat, uh, classifier to be able to encode like the size of that. So when it comes to specifically comparing ASL and Navajo, um, as, as we mentioned before, Sapala, but a more specific case is in Sapala 1978. In um, he he quotes um, there's here's a direct quote from uh, from that paper where he says that, um, for example, Navajo classifiers are part of the verb stem. In ASL, a classifier hand shape is combined simultaneously with the verb stem movement. So, so this is kind of like the initial kind of first instance of when ASL, ASL and Navajo are beginning to be compared. And um, so, yeah. Um, uh, Sapala gives a, a more specific example where he uses actually going back to the Allen 1977 um, kind of uh, typological research. He, in, in Allen 1977, he, uh, he actually uses um, these Navajo examples here to show um, how the stem changes um, and how this also um, kind of um, gives you different meanings on the, the word money. Beso. So, in, in for instance, in three A, beso sa there, the 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 stem 
is um, kind of forcing this meaning on the word money to make it seem um, to make it sound like or sorry to give the, the the meaning of the word money into a coin so basically essentially a uh, the coin is lying or laying um, in place and in 3b we have bezos and nil there we kind of get this uh, double meaning where it could mean some coins but it could also mean um just some money or lying in place um whereas the last example 3c we have bezos and in this case uh it it just simply refers to the flat flexible nature of a piece of uh, like a banknote. so so as you can see in the picture the dollar bill the dollar bill is laying in place um so basically those were the first examples that uh, uh one one of the example that sapala used in order to compare that to asl and so So here's an example then of basically what Sapala wrote, uh, specifically after he gives those examples. He says, well, isn't this interesting that Navajo has this way of distinguishing, you know, between like different types of money like this or different types of objects that are being handled? Well, ASL does that too. So here he gives this, this same three-way example where he's talking about basically you could have like coins, a flat round shaped object that is located somewhere or a wide flat hand shape like a piece of a piece of paper um, like a like a dollar bill is laying there or that you could have kind of like a pile of money right we would all like to have a pile of money laying there so those three examples he says look these are ways that you can do basically the same kind of thing in asl these are like verbal classifiers so just because I really hate just using those, those really old drawings, I wanted to show you um, a real life human actually can make these same signs rather than just looking at um, line drawings from the 1970s. So here's a collaborator of mine, um, Julie Hakusang. Um, she's a professor at Gallaudet University of Linguistics. So she so kindly um, helped make some videos for me. Um, so I'm going to play them in order, but basically you'll see on the left is the flat round object. Um, the second one is the flat object, like a dollar bill. And then the third one is like a clump of money. And I don't know if you noticed, but in all of these, there's kind of a hold after she does the classifier, right? So she places it in space and then she holds it. So that's basically like this locative construction, these location constructions, which is saying this object that, that's shaped in this way is located here, right? So that's the whole verbal complex, even though it's just one sign. So it tells you something about the shape and the location in the one sign. Okay, so now we get to the problematizing part. So, so far we've been telling you what other people have been saying um, about these historical comparisons, but as others have pointed out, this wasn't a clean comparison from the start. So a couple of the problems from the beginning are that one, the typology of classifiers from the get-go was based on spoken languages, right? Because sign languages weren't really um, being considered at the time and the research that these people did on all of these languages in the world didn't include sign languages. So that's already kind of a bias. The second thing is that the predicate classifier list wasn't comprehensive in Allen's original typology. So you can see that Eichenwald and Grinwald afterward have kind of added to refine those categories. But when um, Sapala was first working with these categories in the 70s, they weren't fully complete. And then finally, and, and maybe most egregiously, is that Allen's typology thought of Navajo as having separate morphemes for the verb and the classifier, when in fact, the classificatory verb is a single stem that incorporates both of those meanings into one piece. 
So it's not something that you can can pull apart. And that kind of also biased the way that sign language researchers started to compare these predicate classifiers um, to Navajo based on this kind of like false assumption. So uh, um, another misleading uh, um, problem, or at least um, another problem with the comparison between ASL and Navajo is that um, uh, prior research made comparisons based on misleading terminologies or misinterpretation, misinterpretations of the data, like um, um, Corinne just said. Um, one, one instance of where a, mis a misleading terminology is the, the use of uh, the use of Navajo handling verbs. So here, um, the hand is only implicit in this construction. So it doesn't necessarily, so in English, you can say, I'm handing you a ball or I'm giving you, I'm handing you a piece of paper. You can say that in English, but in Navajo, when you when you actually say give or bring or um, carry, um, there's there's nothing within the morphology of the language that says says something about a hand. So that's 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 a misleading terminology there. So for instance, here the example yishach, I'm carrying it, and in this case, the it is um, a compact roundish object. Um, uh, there's there's no indication of, of of any kind of handling, so it's rather more like it's implicit in the the, the meaning of carry. So um, I actually asked a student, uh, one of my students, um, uh, when I say I'm carrying something, do you somehow uh, visualize or think of a hand? Um, they're like, yeah, more than likely, if I said if, if someone said in English I'm carrying it more than likely I would think that I'm carrying something. So um, yish'as is more or less kind of like the same way where it does, there is this, um, the hand is implicit in the carrying, but and then, if, then, then I started thinking of other examples where um, maybe where it's something that's not necessarily within the cap capacity of your hands, of, of carrying within your hands, you might might use a different um, word in, in those cases. So. Um, so in, in those cases, you don't really necessarily imply that the hand is being used in the carry, if that makes sense. Okay, so we've thrown all of this terminology at you. We've talked about the historical comparisons between Navajo and ASL. So now, what's the answer? Are they the same or are they different? So here are criteria for comparing these classifier systems. We're basically gonna look at three different things. One is what is the morphological realization? And this kind of goes back to the typological categorizations. Like how does the morphology actually make the classifier happen in the verbal complex? Um, the second thing we're gonna look at is not unrelated to that, but it's basically what type of morphosyntactic constructions are these occurring in, right? So what types of um, verbal constructions take classifiers. And then basically what are just the semantics of the things being profiled or categorized. So we're gonna compare these in the last 15 minutes one by one. So we're gonna start out with this typological features. Um, oh, Jalan, you can do this. Um so um, as we mentioned b before that Eichenwald and um, Grinvald kind of more or less refined the, the, the four original um, categories that Alan proposed in the 1970s. Um, so, um, so what do we mean by refining the categories? So under classificatory, uh, or sorry, under verbal classifiers, um, Eichenwald makes a finer distinction where um, we can uh, uh, make a distinction between, um, as, as, the, as the, the graph shows that, that we can make an a, a initial a distinction between non-root classifier and root. So for the non-root classifier includes something of the kind that Marianne Methune um, and others have described as noun incorporation. And then um, and another branch of the non-root classifiers are the affixal element or affixal type of um, classifiers. So what that basically means is um, um, in some kind of affix or some kind of noun incorporate that goes along with the verb. So, so it's not the verb itself. So, and then as for root, um, 
<clears throat> Eichenwald describes something called suppletive classificatory stems, and those can be further broken down into um, stems that, in, um, that describe the inherent properties of objects being manipulated or <clears throat> things that are being referred to. And then the other one is orientation and stance in space. Um, not only not only is the stem describing the, the inherent properties of the object, but also the orientation in space. So, so those are the, basically the two um, broader kind of like distinctions and then much more refiner, uh, like much more refined kind of like classifications in terms of um, classifiers being non-root or root. Um, and then also over here, I um, uh, I just kind of like decided to put in, throw in this um, where I have nouns up here because nouns are not necessarily part of this verbal classifier classification. Um, the reason why I threw, I threw this in is because I can involve kind of more or less um, kind of mentioned that it is possible that in, in noun incorporating languages that nouns have some kind of um, historical um, so noun incorporate noun incorporates have a a nominal source in terms of the history of that noun incorporate um, so that's the reason why I threw that in And then, so in terms of Navajo's status in, in, in relation to um, Mike involves typology, um, she says that like other non Dene languages, uh, for, for instance, at the Baskin, um, Navajo has, as, as I just mentioned, Navajo has suppletive classificatory stems. So what that means is the stems describe inherent properties. So not only that, but each stem is mutually exclusive to a property or properties. So again, I, I've used these, um, these examples again. Sauce can be only used with things that are flat and flexible. And then joth can only be used with non-compact matter. So for instance, um, cotton, I use uh, cotton as an example. And ka is an open container, so objects that have some kind of container kind of um, shape. So for instance, you, could, you can also even use a bowl, a bowl as, a, as an example. So that, the, so those types of um, stems would go under this inherent properties. Um, we also have something kind of of the sort of uh, of the, the secondary classification that um, <clears throat> Eichenwald makes. So, so uh, where the 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 the, the suppletive stem uh, kind of gives you the orientation and stance uh, of the of of the uh, classified object, um, but it's partially productive in Navajo. Um, and I, I the note I have here is not as productive as other languages. For instance. In Muscogean languages, you have this a much more of a productive system where you have classificatory stems that not only tell you the orientation or stance of an object, but also it, it, it gives you the inherent properties of a stem. In Navajo, the state of aspect marker se um, adds to the orientation. So it's not necessarily the stem in itself that's giving you the orientation, but we do can we we can do uh, we can kind of uh, make a comparison between systems that are pretty much productive versus Navajo. So um, here's the examples I have where um, it, it, it lays or it, it, it is laying. Um, it is sitting or, um, or he or she is sitting and he or she is standing uh, versus inanimate, um, <clears throat> in, 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 inanimate referent where you have kind of like an open slot for um, a classificatory stem. So you can just put in anything that's inanimate in terms of the classificatory stems. And then at the bottom here, uh, where we have stand inanimate referent, that that corner, uh, we have other uh, ver more or less uh, pr predicate class uh, predicate constructions, but they they don't really more or less they don't really go under um, this uh, category of suppletive classificatory stems. They they kind of like do their own thing as well. So. Okay, so what does ASL status look like in this typology? Well, um, it's not really an agreed upon question. So I'm not going to go into the details of why you would support one or the other hypotheses, but basically one hypothesis is that um, set of hypotheses is that it's 
a non-root classifier of aspic, uh, affixal elements. So basically the idea that the classifier handshape is affixed to the movement stem in a particular set of morphemes. So you would think about the handshape as an affix that gets added onto a stem and the stem is actually the movement and the location part of the verb. Um, yeah, so the other way to think about it is still that it's a non-root classifier, but it's, that it's actually a type of noun incorporation. And um, this is something that Sandler and Lilo Martin have talked about, um, but also Irit Meyer in 1999 wrote a really nice paper about this in Israeli sign language as well. So um, really the way that you do this analysis depends a lot on um, your linguistic religion, as it were, right? The kinds of things that you throw into the analysis. Um, but at the end of the day, the basic um, point here is that most people agree that it's a non-root classifier. So to answer that question, are they the same or different in this as aspect? The answer is no. So if you look at this tree that Eichenwald has developed, Navajo is going to pattern with um, languages that do it the way that the right on the right hand side where it's a root um, suppletive classificatory stem and ASL seems to be more in the category of non root classifiers where you have either noun incorporation or some kind of affixation depending on how you want to cut the pie. So, okay, moving on to the next um, example, what types of morphosyntactic constructions do they occur? Um, <clears throat> so for Navajo, um, um, we've, so far we've been only talking about these handling um, stems or handling types. And um, actually, in fact, Navajo has other types of classificatory stems. Um, <clears throat> and we can make a three-way distinction here. And we can include the propel type and the free flight type. And the reason why these are distinctive from the handling type is because their stems are also distinctive as well. So as you can see here, um, although all these verbs are all these predicate constructions here all encode this um, kind of like um, semantic category of compact roundish object, their stems are actually all in fact different. And also not only that, the event structure is different as well. So I'm dropping it versus I'm carrying it. Where you have yish'ath, you can't say yishnet. Um, and then, and 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 for things that are um, kind of like falling on their own, or where there's the there's a there's an object falling or dropping without volition. So in this case, we're kind of dealing in we're getting into the category of non-accusative type of um, constructions. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily passive, but I would say more like unaccusative constructions where. Um, the stems are also distinctive, although again, they're, they're describing the same kind of object. In addition to the um, kind of like those, those kind of uh, new categories that I, I just introduced, we also have what's called mastication verbs. Um, um, and these also kind of more or less classify the types of objects that um, one, um, one is eating, a person is eating. So um, um, these are very different. So at the top here, these are different from your regular eat and drink um, uh, um, classificatory, I mean, sorry, uh, stems. But up here on top, we have, um, uh, again, very distinctive uh, stems that describe a type of object that you're chewing on or you're eating. So for instance, at the very top, we have chewing hard objects, chewing leafy matter, um, eating plural objects, and so on. So for instance, um, an example of eating plural objects would be something like, I'm eating berries. 
Um, and then of course there's a there's a stem for eating meat. So the, for those people that are not vegan, so you can use those stems. Um, over here, the 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 chart I on on the left. Um, at least my left um, is basically a chart from um, a very big dictionary call, uh, called uh, the Navajo lexicon. And basically they have a, a chart for basically these uh, mastication verbs. So, um, and they basically uh, have a list of uh, types of um, foods that you can either use with these stems or not. So basically where the check is, 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 is those stems would actually work with the type of um, stems. So, um, so, so in addition to the four, uh, the, 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 the three that I just introduced, we have these, these mastication verbs. These are not necessarily um, um, motion verbs as well, but they still classify. So we, we, we're, so we're making a distinction between um, not only motion verbs, but also um, non-motion verbs as well. So. Um, so here are all the categories for Navajo. So um, I, again, as I just mentioned that, that we can make a distinction between motion and non-motion um, um, predication, uh, predicate uh, constructions. And then each of these have transitive or intransitive categories as well. Um, so under transitive, we have the handling and, um, and, and, much, uh, and a subtype of handling would be a ditransitive construction. And then we have the, the propel that's also a transitive, so I'm dropping it. And then, but um, for mo motion constructions that are uh, intransitive, we would include the free, the free flight there. So those are un unaccusative constructions. So again, it dropped, it fell. Um, then under non-motion, we have transitive, uh, we also have transitive and transitive um, distinctions. Um, under transitive, we have uh, mastication, but we also have something else called pseudo causatives. And then um, <clears throat> those are something like I'm, I keep my I keep my broom in the closet or something like that, um, where you're you're describing the keeping of it. The it there being um, classified would be a uh, some kind of like a stick like object. So I keep my my broom in the closet. Um, so those are not, those are kind of pseudo causative slash pseudo transitive, if you want to call them that. And then <clears throat> for intransitives, we have these things that are called um, positional. So basically, those are basically like the examples that um, Alan gave initially. So the, the money is on the table, the money is in place, those those examples, those those would be the positionals. Um, so what, what we have here in light blue, the circles in light blue are essentially, those would be the, the examples that people have primarily used to compare Navajo to ASL. So So a little bit different from Navajo, actually, whereas Jalan just decided that, described that the stems are what change and the rest of the construction stays the same. In ASL, it's actually the opposite of that, where the stem stays the same and the hand shape is what changes. So this is another kind of difference between the two. So if you imagine that the, the root here is the source path goal verb, which is basically like from point A to point B, something moves along this trajectory that you can change the hand shape to um, basically classify different types of objects that are doing this motion or subjects that are doing this motion. So for example, you have like source path goal, you have the car drove, right? Like the vehicle drove from point A to point B. You have the upright animate, I can't see my own screen. Is this the, this one? Um, you have the um, examples that are walking. next. The examples right. are next. Yeah. And then the next one is the animate um, upright object that can walk from point A to point B. And then the next one is like crawling from point A to point B. So you can see that the verbal complex is really this source path goal movement and location, but then the hand shape basically switches out to make different constructional um, schemas. So I don't have time to go through all of these examples right now, unfortunately, but these are just a couple of examples of the types of constructions. This is um, motion verbs can have different um, classificatory verbs. 
Um, Non-motion verbs can also have different classificatory verbs. Um, Non-motion handling constructions can have different hand shapes. Um, but when we get to this kind of categorization, like what Jalan showed before, we can separate into motion and non-motion, but these three red um, bolded examples here are basically kind of the prototypes that people talk about in terms of comparing Navajo with ASL. But you can see like Navajo, there are actually also a lot of other kinds of things going on here within the categorization of the types of classifiers that are allowed or that are productive in ASL. So to answer that question, the answer is it's complicated, right? So some of the morphosyntax is very similar in the sense that the same types of constructions tend to have classatory verbs. Um, but again, going back to how it actually gets instantiated, it's actually almost opposite in a way where the classifier stem in Navajo is the thing that changes out, whereas in the verb stem in ASL stays the same and the classifier, classifier hand shape changes out. Okay, so we're basically at time now. So um, just to make the last point very briefly, semantics, what is being characterized or profiled? So here, I, we don't have time to go through all of these examples, but here you can see um, handling types for ASL, the different types of hand shapes, the definitions, and the examples of what you might um, be talking about. And so we, at least, so for at least what we wanted to show was basically that a lot of the same objects, uh, object classification are very similar, but the, one of the differences between ASL and Navajo is that Navajo has a, a lot more um, distinctive stems um, so that, that was kind of like the main point of those slides there, but we can go back to those if, if anyone has a question about that. Right, so basically here on the left, we say that there are some things that do get categorized the same, and yet even within this kind of very similar system, there are things that get categorized differently. So um, future considerations, things we haven't really looked in depth about are what are the restrictions and what are the functions? So function has normally been kind of a secondary examination and mostly people have been talking about what are the morphosyntactic restrictions as to where these classifier stems show up. But Jalan and I are interested in what their function is. So it might be the case that even though they show up in those constructions that their functions are actually far more varied than what people have given them credit for. And then also there's this additional problem of synchronic versus diachronic perspectives. Um, in the type of linguistics Jalan and I do, grammaticalization paths are really important and um, they connect prototypical classifiers with other types of constructions that might not be considered classificatory because they have some kind of um, frozen lexicon status within ASL. Or even in Navajo as well. Um, so the take home messages are basically the ontological categories seem to be similar, although when you really get in the weeds, you can see that there are still differences between um, what those categories are and what is included in those categories. Um, number two is that specific predicate types uh, which classify objects may be similar, um, but they also can be different. So again, the basically statives and verbs of motion, verbs of location, um, verbs of handling, all of these types of things in both languages are encoded with classifier stems. But then the extent to which Navajo and ASL use classifiers for other types of structures is completely different. Um, and then um, implementation of formal properties um, that one we basically decided is the different one, which is this is the branching tree, Eichenwald's tree, where it's like how it actually gets implemented is pretty different in the two languages. The realization. Yeah, the, the actual morphological realization. And then finally, um, 
something we didn't get into today, and I made it through a whole presentation about ASL without using the word iconicity, but here it is on the last slide and the last bullet point, which is that there are, of course, also these modality differences in terms of not only iconicity, as Jalan had kind of alluded to before, whether or not the hand is actually implied or physically present in the construction itself, but also just in the ability to kind of break apart words in a language like ASL versus a language like Navajo, where maybe you might say you can really explicitly see that this hand shape can be changed up for a different hand shape. And because of the visual nature, it's maybe easier to assume that those are compositional um, versus the more segmental structure of Navajo, which you can't really make those kinds of breaks. You mean non-segmental nature? So, so for instance, so the classificatory stems are basically portmanteau, portmanteau, portmanteau stems that you can't point out what part is the object part. You can't point out what part is the verbal part. So, 